Mark 4, verses 1 through 20. The text reads, Again he began to teach by the seaside. A large crowd was gathered before him, so that he entered a boat and set it on the sea. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. He taught them many things in parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen and take note. A sower went out to sow, and he sowed. Some seed fell beside the path, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and soon it sprang up, because it did not have deep soil. But when the sun rose, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell along the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell on the ground, and it yielded grain that sprang up and increased by thirty, sixty, or a hundred times as much. Then he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, those who were around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. He said to them, to you is given the secret of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, everything is said in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Then he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are those beside the path where the word is sown. But when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word which is sown in their hearts. Others, likewise, are seeds sown on rocky ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, but have no root in themselves. And so endure for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution rises for the, world's, for the word's sake, immediately they fall away. Others are seed sown among thorns, the one who hears the word. But the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. Still others are seed sown on good ground. Those who hear the word and receive it and bear fruit 30, 60, or 100 times as much. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your word. I give thanks this day for you because of who you are. God, we are gathered together amongst your people. We lift up the name of Jesus. We read your inspired text. Lord, that you may speak to us. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I ask a special anointing upon these people. Lord, I pray that if there needs to be salvation today, it be found today. Lord, I pray if there need be healing, there be healing today. Lord, if somebody needs a deliverance from something, there be a deliverance today. And Lord, I pray for those who are weeping, that you will bring them comfort. Lord, that those who are rejoicing, that they learn to rejoice in the Lord. Lord, I pray that those who are proud be humbled. And those who are humbled be lifted up. Lord, I ask for a special touch to preach this message. Lord, I must do it in humility. And I need your hand. But it's because it can be hard. But Lord, you will guide all our steps. The steps of the righteous are guided by you, O oh Father. Bless these, your people. Give them ears to hear this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. This is a part in the ministry of Jesus where crowds started coming out of the woodwork to see what he's doing. He's performing miracles. He's making food appear out of nowhere and filling everybody's belly. And no one goes away hungry. He's confounding the religious teachers. And they're like, 
Wow, I've never been confronted like that before. To the point where even they shut up. Well, you can shut up a religious expert. You've done something amazing. That's a miracle. Jesus did this. And people were coming from all around. And I can imagine the throngs being drawn to him for various reasons and various motivations, various things that draw you to him. But then Jesus throws this out there like he always does. He confounds you. He will challenge you. He will twist you. He will throw something at you, a little wrench at you and say, well, what about this? He did this here. Because here's all these crowds coming out to see him. And you know what? Rightfully so. Rightfully so that the crowds should throng around the Son of God. But why are they there? What are they looking for? And Jesus basically here tells a parable which he explains. And it's for the good reason and the timing of God that he could not yet bring forth his mission. And what had to be accomplished, things have to be accomplished in God's timing, not man's timing. So he tells these parables where he's explaining the truth. You're just going to figure it out later. I'm telling you the truth. I'm planting this seed into you. Later it's going to grow up. But right now you're just going to be like, well, what's happening? What's going on? All right? And here... You have these inner people get around Jesus and they're like, um, so what are we talking about? What's all this throwing seed stuff? Growing things and weeds and rocks and I don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. And of course he's like, you don't get it? You see, Jesus is talking to those who have ears to hear. Not just ears. But ears to hear. Let him who have ears to hear. Hear. Sometimes you will hear things in a spiritual language. And it might confound you. But it's probably because your ears ain't listening. They're not open yet. You're not ready to receive what God is planting into you. Right at that moment. But see here. Jesus. It's talking about dirt. It's talking about dirt. When I, look, when I go back to this, to the text, as it always does, it, it grounds me and it gives me a little more sense into my world because I, I believe there's a false idea floating around amongst many of God's people that if we're just nicer, if, if we're more tolerant, if I'm more giving, if I, if I put on a super display of I'm super Christian, that people will see it and go, oh, man, you're so cool. And I didn't realize how uncool I was. And now I want to be just like you. I think that's a lie. It's a lie because Jesus said, look, some are going to hear and they ain't going to get it. Some are going to hear, they're going to receive for a time, and then they're going to walk away. And some are going to hear, and then it's going to bear fruit in their life. And it's not always because we didn't do enough as the church. Now, rest assured, there are many who give a bad report to Jesus Christ. And you look upon their life, and that if you didn't know they went to church, you, and you look just at their life, you'd be shocked if they did. They do one thing, and then another. They play along with religious procedures, show up sometimes, disappear for most of it, but they're Christian. They live like the world. It gives a bad example to the body of Christ. But rest assured, that cannot be the excuse for anyone to reject God. They will answer to their maker. You will too. Don't let their example be your example. I want to press to you two questions today. I want to haunt you with two questions today. All right? I want it to haunt you. I want it to haunt you to the point where you come to peace with God 
or you are just a mess until you do with these two questions. One, what kind of dirt are you? What kind of dirt are you? And two, what's all you're going to get? What is all you're going to get? Now, when I say what kind of dirt are you, you're probably thinking, well, you call me dirt? Well, yes, I am. Without the life breath of God, we are nothing but the dirt from the earth. The life you have isn't yours. It is given to you by the life breath of God. You're dirt otherwise. The question is, what kind of dirt are you? Jesus gives us four examples, four categories. And I realize that there are times where us as Americans refuse to receive a label and refuse to be put into a category. And I'm so special, no one else is like me. And that might be true, but you're in a category. Even if it's a category all by yourself. But Jesus, Jesus gives us four grand categories of people. You're in one of them. I guarantee it. You're in one of them. If you have a trouble seeing which one you're in, talk with me afterward, and in a few minutes we will discover where you belong. But I'm pretty sure you know which one you're in today. He gives us four examples of dirt. And again, which dirt are you? What kind of dirt are you? First one is the beaten path. Is what he talks about. Now if you know the beaten path, that's where everybody walks. All right? It is the well-traveled and broad way that leads to destruction and many take it. It's the way of the world. It's the easiest way to get to where you want to go and to do what you, you want to do. Nothing stops you in the way on the path. You're not concerned with what grows there on the path because there's no life on the path. There is no life. It only leads to your death and your destruction. That's the path. Now, when the seed is sown being the word, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, which I'm going to give you before I'm done. When it lands on you, when it's received by you and you're on the beaten path, you don't have ears to hear. Because you're going your own way and you don't care. When the seed, when that word is planted into you, it gets stumpled in by the world. And if anything's left, the enemy is going to scoop it in and take it away. And it's gone. Like it was never even put into you. Because why? You're going where you want to go on the beaten path. You're not concerned with providing God with His reasonable expectation. Which is a harvest. If you don't know what a harvest is, and, and I'm, not, I'm not being mean. Not everybody has grown up as I have. Maybe you're from a background where, like, you don't even know what a house plant is. And that's fine. But a harvest is, is if I plant stuff, by the time it grows up, I expect to get stuff back. That's a harvest. Okay? If you want to do it in other terms, if I invest money into something, when the time comes around for return on investment, I expect to get something back. That's a harvest. God expects a harvest in your life. A harvest of repentance, a harvest of righteousness, a harvest of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. It is not a hope for thing. It is not something he's cheering on that it might show up. It is his reasonable expectation on your life. He wants a harvest. He expects a harvest. And he's not going to hear, well, here's a little bit. When you plant something, when you invest something, do you just want a little bit back? No. God don't want you a little bit. He wants a harvest. Uh -huh. on. If you're on the beaten path, you have no concern about a harvest. None. If you happen to intertwine with the workings of Jesus or the church, it's simply because the path you're choosing has lined up with it for a time, but as soon as that path goes somewhere else, you're gone. Probably we have jokes about the church and how smarter you are. And I only know that because that was me on the beaten path. The next dirt, or before I go on, 
You're on the beaten path. You, you're free to go and do what you want. You can indulge in whatever you want. Nothing's going to stop you. You don't feel no obstacles. You're free to do what you want. And I want to tell you something. Let's just say hypothetically, hypothetically, you indulge in all these sins and you somehow avoid all of the expected negative consequences of them. Let's say you've slept with everything moving and avoided a, a sexually transmitted disease. Or you've avoided children that you've had to pay for. Or you've avoided dodging people who want to kill you. Let's say you have stolen stuff and somehow you've never had to answer for it. Let's say you've hurt people and you've been able to get away with it for so long and it doesn't come back on you. Let's say you get to live life on your terms and you get to do what you want. And at the end of it, you get away with everything and you live a full life. 70, 80, 90, 100 years. Let's make it 200 years. Just because we're so advanced. I'll give you 300 years. You live life on your terms and you get exactly what you want, when you want, and you don't answer to nobody, especially to God. You enjoy it. Because that is all the heaven you are going to get. That is all the heaven you are going to get. Because you have an eternity of hell waiting for you to meet that God that you have mocked and avoided your entire life. That is all the heaven you are going to get and you better live it up. That's all you got. That's all you're going to get. The second dirt Jesus talked about is the shallow dirt. It's got a bunch of rocks in it. Okay? There, you've heard the word. You've received it. You get a little excited about it. Okay? But then all of a sudden, things get hard. Let me not sugarcoat this for you. I'm certainly not going to sit here and tell you that if you accept Jesus, all your problems are going to disappear. I'm not going to tell you that if you accept Jesus, money is going to fall from the sky and there will be a Ferrari waiting for you in your parking lot. I'm not going to say if you donate to me, to me personally in my ministry that somehow blessings are going to immediately spring up into your life. All right? I, I'm not going to tell you those things because they're lies. Okay? When you accept Jesus Christ, and many of you, maybe you're experiencing this right now, all of a sudden you... Things you've never even concerned with now are a problem to you. You have issues suddenly spring up. You're going to have your persecution. You're going to have the reaction of family and friends. You're going to have employers and employees come against you. You're going to have people kind of treat you a little bit differently simply because you dare lift up the name of Jesus. And it's going to get hard. But because it's hard and it's not what you bargained for because you accepted a false gospel that says your problems will disappear if you just simply act like I do in church, that's a lie. But see, things get hard and it's not what you bargained for. And because you have shallow dirt and you have all them rocks of bitterness and fear in you, it, that faith withers up and it dies. And you know what? You're back on the beaten path again. Then there's the thorny dirt. Thorny dirt. This one's just as deadly. You receive, you receive that seed of Jesus in you. But see, you've probably took that seed with certain expectations that if I do this, I will receive material blessing. My debts will disappear. I'll get that super special job. Right? And, and it won't. I won't have to worry. That's not true. When the, when the fears of this world and the desire for riches and the desire for things begin to creep into your life, it will choke out your faith. And it will be as nothing and you'll be back on a beaten path. I want to tell you something. Let's say again, I give you 300 years to live. And you're shallow soil. And you're just trying to avoid conflict and pain. And you thought God was going to solve all those issues. And, that, and that, that's just the pain became too much and you walked away. And let's say you get to live in all the security you want. Everyone will love you and never smirk at you and never persecute you. And everybody's just so they just, they're cool. And they love you. 
forever, for all 300 years. You enjoy it. Because that is all the heaven you're going to get. Let's say I get, I'll give you 500 years to rake up those riches. To have all the fancy things. To have your status and your prestige and the honor and all the glory that you can drum up for yourself. And never worry about how much money you have. Or if you can spend it. Or if you will eat. You enjoy it. Because that is all the heaven you're going to get. Live it long. That's it. If that's your hope. If that's your expectation. That is all the heaven you're going to get. Then he talks about the good dirt. The gospel takes root in you. And steadily. Over the span of your whole life. It begins to grow. It looks different in so many people, but there, there's a growth in you. And you begin to bring forth that harvest, a harvest of repentance and righteousness and the fruits of the Spirit that God expects. And, and it, could, it could vary by time with people, by abundance and various things, but rest assured it's coming. There's going to be a harvest there. But see, if you're the good dirt, on the one hand, you have the suffering because of the persecution and the hatred of the world. Because I'm going to tell you something. They don't just hate you because you're mean. Or you're not super Christian or nice enough. Okay? If you just simply dare to say, I'm living my life this way because I lift up the name of Jesus. You're going to offend somebody. They are not going to like it because the light is shining into their darkness. That is not an excuse for you to embrace darkness. But see, that's going to bring a reaction from the world. Jesus said, if they hate me, guess what? They're going to hate you. I mean, you can say, if I'm just like Jesus, everybody will love me and they'll join the church. But I'm telling you, they crucified him. What do you think you're going to get? He said, you're not above me. If they treat me this way, they're going to treat you this way. The world hates you because of me. That's hard. When you're good dirt and you're trying to please God and you want to live that life, a life of holiness which looks, can look different from everything around you. That hurts. I don't know about you, but that, that, it, it hurts. It's painful. That's on one hand. And then on the other hand, you have the divine correcting and loving hand of God. The discipline of the Lord. When you start to stray off a little bit. Because see his path is straight and narrow. I might want to go this way. But God says no you're going this way. I want to kind of go. <laughs> go this way. All right? God fixes you. God will correct you. Because he corrects those he loves. If you don't feel the correction of God. You might, you might not be his child. Okay? And I say that plainly. I want to wake up into you again my two questions. What kind of dirt are you? And what's all you going to get? And you can go through this life and you're trying to bear a harvest for God. And oftentimes you're like, I don't know if I'm even growing it fast enough. And I've got the pain of the world and it's persecution and it's rising up against me. I'm on in. And on the other hand, I'm feeling the rod of the correction of God. And it's painful just the same. And it's like it feels like I'm, I'm your child, but I'm living like it's hell on earth. But I want to tell you, that is all the hell you are going to get. That is all the hell you're going to get. Oh, it's hell. It's a taste of hell. But you're tasting just a glimpse what everyone else is getting who refuses the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ. But you have yet to taste of the heaven that is coming. You have yet to taste of the glory that is found in Jesus Christ. And you're going to look back and you're like, you know what? I was crying and I was wimpy. I was a punk. And I was like, man, you know, what a loser. And you're like ashamed. And it's like, you know, even in heaven, you don't want to even tell your story. Because like, you know, I can't believe how whiny I was. Right? Because, man, look at this. What was I complaining about? But right now, you know what? We're, we're whiny. We're complaining. It hurts. 
And you know what? It should hurt. God is keeping you on a path in a sinful world. It's going to hurt. But that is all the hell you're going to get. You have an abundance of treasure, an inheritance from the royal family that you now belong to, and that is all the hell you're going to get. You have an eternity of heaven waiting for you. And you can march on, no matter how hard it is, knowing what you have waiting for you when you see your God. What kind of dirt are you? Where do you right now stand before God? Now, if I was to ask you, you, you could maybe fool me because I don't know you. Maybe. If I don't get discernment, you might fool me. You might fool others around you. That often don't happen, but maybe you could do that. But you know what kind of dirt you are right now. You know if you're on the beaten path. You know if you have some shallow soil. You know if you got some thorns in your life. And you know if you're good dirt. But what are you going to do about it? What's all you going to get? What is all you going to get? Now, let, let me definitely clarify something for you. No one starts out as good dirt. No one stand. I can't stand here and preach to you like I, I, I'm this special piece of earth that God found magically and he, it's his benefit. No. I benefit by him. The good dirt comes from the master gardener. Okay? You, your dirt's all messed up. Okay, without God, you, you got some messed up fields. Okay? And if anybody tried to plant anything righteous in you, it's just going to get swallowed up and lost. It's nothing going to... But you know what? God will make you a good field. He will fix your dirt. He will put a life in you that you don't have right now. See, if you're on the beaten path right now, the plow of the law can break up your ground and you can receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you've got stones of bitterness and fear in your life, the mercy that is found through Jesus Christ can take them out of that field. Yes. If you got them thorns of worry and desire and you just want material things and you're so obsessed with what you have and a fear of what you're going to lose, the fire of the Holy Spirit can burn them up out of your life. And if you're good dirt, doubt creeps in. You begin to worry, am I burying a harvest? Because if you, if you really want to honor God, you worry about these things after time. Am I doing right? Am I doing enough? It, it, everything, it's like, God, I'm constantly failing you, but I, I want to assure you, because you are good dirt, because your dirt is in the hand of the master gardener, by and by that seed is going to grow and you are going to bring forth a harvest. Now, what's all you going to get? What's all you going to get? You want to live life on your terms? You want to avoid persecution? You want to enjoy all the cool stuff of life? You'll be tempted by wealth and security to fulfill you? Well, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you're going to die. That's all you're going to get. That's all to heaven you're going to get. Live it up. But you don't have to. You don't have to. All right? You're off the beaten path and you have prepared good dirt and you're enduring the pains because of the gifts of God. This is a short time in comparison of eternity of what you have. And this is all the hell you're going to get. What's all you're going to get? Do you want to deal with your hell now and get it over with in expectation of heaven? Or do you want all your heaven right now and then you put your hell on hold. What you, what's all you're going to get? I mean, that. <laughs> choose now what you're going to get. This is it. I'm going to tell you, it's, if you're here serving God, and, and maybe I've just touched a glimpse on some of the hardship that comes upon you simply because you, you are a child of God. And you look at things around you, and, and I, 
And again, I, I'm talking because of me. All right? You look at people and you're like, how are they prospering so much better than me? All right? Why are they not worrying about this, that, or the other, yet I am? Okay? Why are they getting away with all of their crazy sins and it's like God's not even watching them? I want to tell you something. God looks down. And he sees his enemies plotting and scheming, making all these devised plans of how they're going to outwit God. And he just looks down and he laughs. He laughs at them because he knows their time's coming. He's laughing at their very effort. Don't look, at, don't look at the enemies of God if you're good dirt and wonder, Lord, what is wrong with this picture? Just know God is laughing and you can too. Third time's coming. All right, just, just laugh it off. Step on because you're good dirt. And God loves you. And this is all the hell you're going to get. I don't know where you stand right now with God. But you do. I, I, every one of you, you're in one of those categories. And I, and I want to tell you, look, if you're on the path or you shallow soil, you thorny soil, this is, not the tame, this is not the time to be ashamed of that and, and try to suppress that knowledge. If the Holy Spirit is moving upon you of conviction, don't you delay. God wants to heal you. God wants to prepare your soil. He wants to put a blessing into your life to bring back a harvest. A harvest of repentance. A harvest of righteousness. A harvest of the fruits of the Spirit in your life. He wants to do that for you. And as for all people. If the conviction of the Holy Spirit is upon you right now. I want you to hear again as I sow some seed into you right now. There was a man. That man was named Jesus. He dwelt among us when he didn't have to. He was born the Son of God. God became a man and walked among us. And he lived among us. He didn't come as a grand king. Or a conqueror. Or a big flashy businessman. He came as a carpenter's son. And I don't think that's an accident. Because God's the creator. Of course he'd come as a carpenter. He likes to make stuff. He lives as many of us lived. He was of no consequence in the eyes of the important of the time. But he didn't come just to live with us. And to say hey you're, we're chums. No he came for a mission. He came for a reason. And that reason was. Because if you are left as you are. Your dirt is a mess. If you are left as you are. You will die in your sins. And you will be separated from God. For an eternity. But he came. With a, with a love. That says. I love you so much. I would rather die than lose you. Because he hung on a cross to die in your place, to perform a sacrifice, to give and shed his blood for you to cover your sins. When he was lifted up, it wasn't some sucker or chump that just got lifted up just so you didn't have to. Your sins were lifted up on the cross with him. When you see him, don't just see him. You see your sins. You see your sins. Because your sins put them there. Well, you know what? Here's what's cooler. He did. We could wrap it up and say amen. But you know what? It didn't end there. Because see, the enemies of God buried him in a tomb. A rock tomb. They sealed that tomb. They put a guard of soldiers on that tomb. And on the third day, he rose again. You know what? That body ain't there. You can go right now and that tomb's still empty. You know why? Because he ain't there. He rose from the grave. He rose from the grave, defeating death. And you may have life, life eternal, life abundant, 
eternal life in heaven with Jesus. And I don't care what kind of dirt you think you are right now. I don't care how undeserving you think you are right now. You might be like the person, like you, you were petrified even coming these doors. And you're like, I can't wait to get out of these doors. And, and you think maybe the roof's going to cave in on you any second. And it was by the grace of God, lightning didn't strike you in the parking lot. I want to tell you, you're closer to God than probably anyone else. God will lift up the humble. And he resists the proud. If you're all proud and thinking I'm good because I'm good with God because of what I have done, you, God will reject you. But he will lift up the humble. Those that know I don't, I don't deserve the love of God. I don't deserve anything he has done for me. I have no right of being counted among his people. Yet you are closer to the kingdom of God. Because God will lift up the humble. And he desires to heal you. He wants to remove your rocks. He wants to burn up your thorns. He wants to break up your paths. He wants to make you good dirt. He wants you to bring forth a harvest. He wants you to bring forth your repentance. He wants you to bring forth righteousness. He wants you to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit in your life. And he will do it. But not if you say don't touch my field. Not if you like, oh, not in my field. Not in my mess, I like my mess. I like my dirt just the way it is. Well, it'll stay that way. But you invite the gardener into your life. He will begin to work. And you will bring forth a harvest. What kind of dirt are you? And what's all you going to get? Please stand with me.